There is no lack in heaven. Any and everything we need is there, and God wants to get that provision of heaven to your earth. This message is the third in the series, Heaven to Earth. The message is entitled, The Provisions of Heaven. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. Hi, Pastor Dale here. Thanks for joining us this weekend. So glad that you're part of the service. Hope that you're having a great summer, knowing that God is with you. He's working in your life, and we're looking forward to all He's going to do in your days to come. We're involved in a series, From Heaven to Earth. We're talking about how God wants to bring His heaven down into your earth. We're going to talk this weekend about the provisions of heaven. As we go back to the Holy Land, look at various sites in the Holy Land, and some important lessons, teaching times. So I hope you'll open your heart, expect to receive from God this weekend that He wants to bring provision from heaven into your earth. Let's go to the Holy Land together. Welcome to St. Anne Church, and actually what is most important where we are today is the Pool of Bethesda. And right behind me, you see this pool uh, area that's the remains of the Pool of Bethesda. I'll talk about it here in just a moment from John chapter 5. And so if you want to turn there in your Bibles to a story that's uh, perhaps familiar to you in Scripture, a very important message that Jesus gave, a very important miracle that Jesus did that teaches us a number of lessons in our own lives. And so I want to read for you from John chapter 5. I'll begin in verse number 1, and we'll read down through verse number, number 9. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in, the, in, in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid re replied, I have no one to help me. Into the pool when the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. This is a story of one of the miracles that Jesus did actually here in the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he came here one day during a time of Jewish festival, and he came here on purpose. He came here because there were a lot of sick people that would gather around this pool. And the uh, tradition, the idea behind this is there were times that an angel would come down and stir the waters in the Pool of Bethesda, and the first one to get in would be healed. We don't know a lot about that tradition. Uh, we do know that it's recorded, especially in some of the manuscripts of the, uh, of the New Testament. Not all the manuscripts contain that, but uh, that's the background of the story. And so as Jesus came, there were a lot of people around this pool waiting to get well waiting for a cure, and he zeroes in on one particular person. I like to think about the fact that Jesus always sees every one of us individually. There's a lot of people here, but he's able to identify you and the need that you have in your life. And I noticed this morning as I was studying this passage again, looking over it, I want you to look with me specifically at verse number six, because I want to highlight just a couple of things. Before I do, let me mention the word Bethesda for you. The word Bethesda literally means the house of mercy or the house of kindness. And so the Pool of Bethesda was a place that was known as the house of kindness or the house of mercy. But notice verse number six. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? I want to draw out just a few phrases from that particular verse. The Bible says that Jesus saw him, one particular man, lying here by this pool. Now, there were lots of people lying here, right? The Bible says that this is where a lot of sick people would come. But his eyes went to one particular person lying there, and the Bible says that he had been in this condition for a long time. We, as you read the story, you find out that he'd actually been sick for and an invalid for 38 years. Almost four decades he'd been suffering. Someone would likely have brought him to this place every day. He had very little friends in his life because he said, no one is able to help me get into the pool. And so he was a man that was living in a lot of alone, aloneness, if you will. He was a man that probably had very few friends, just someone that could get him back and forth to the Pool of Bethesda. And he had been suffering in this condition for a long time. And the Bible says that Jesus approached him and said, do you want to get well? Would you say that phrase with me? Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? That's a very important statement because when you've been in a problem for a long, long time, you kind of lose hope that that problem is ever going to go away. When you've been in a situation for four decades, almost 40 years, your whole life has now been 
uh, identified with your problem. You've been identified as a person who can't get up out of their circumstance. And there are a lot of people that will go through life and having an issue that has lasted for a long time. And at some point in time, they've tried to get help from here and tried to get, get help from there and hope that someone help, would help them, if you will, get into the pool like this man was hoping for. But no one was able to help him. No one had gotten him into the pool for his cure. And so he'd suffered for a long time, and this long-term illness had brought him to the place of hopelessness. He did not believe that his life could ever change again. And maybe there's some of us today and some of us that will be watching this by video that you've gone through a problem that has lasted for a really long time. You'd hope that you would have gotten over it by now, but you've gotten to the place where it seemed like that particular issue seems to be something that just hangs on for a long, long time. For this man, it could have been his whole life or most of his life. And you lose hope. And one of the things that, that happens to us over the long haul of problems is the loss of our hope, the loss that our future can be any different. And we then begin to identify with our problem and we become a victim of our problem. And we believe that the problem now defines us, that we are our problem. And I want to remind you, this is, this is exactly where this man was. He was identifying himself as a victim of his circumstances that things could never change. Here's the good thing to remember. Jesus always comes in and he transforms victims into victors. He always comes in and takes people who believe they've been victimized by life and circumstances, and when he arrives on the scene, he lifts their victim mentality and brings them to the place of realizing there can be hope for your future. And so that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he asked the man the question, do you want to get well? He was stimulating in this man the hope that his future could be different than his past. One of the things I love about Jesus is that Jesus doesn't define us about our past. He calls us forward to our future. And so this man, in this moment, he hears this question, and this is a very significant question because he's, he's been in this condition for 40 years. Think about this, almost 40 years. This, is how de this has defined him. And so to get well means that his life is going to change. Everything's going to change about his life. He's got to go get a job. He's got to find a new way of living, and life is going to be defined very differently. And so Jesus said, sir, do you want to get well? And there was something in this man's heart that said, yes, this is what I want with my life. I want to be whole. I want to be well. And then Jesus said to him, take up your mat and walk. That mat represented everything about his past. It represented everything about 38 years of his life. And he said, I want you to grab hold of that thing that you have identified with for 38 years of your life that has been your problem, that has been your circumstance, that has been what has defined you. I want you to grab hold of that mat. I want you to pick it up. I want you to carry that forward with you. I want you to rise up and go forward with a new dimension of life because I've now brought you hope. And the Bible in that moment says that the man rose up, grabbed his mat, and began to walk and gave testimony to what Jesus had done in his life. You know, sometimes we're defined by our mats. I don't know what your mat is, what your problem has been, what's defined you in your life. It's been the thing that you, I look at, so that's, that's really who I've been for so very long. But Jesus comes along and says, do you want to live on the mat for the rest of your life, or do you want to grab that mat, take it up, and walk? And the good news is that this man made the decision to say, you know what, I'm not going to let my mat define me for my future. I'm grabbing my mat because now in this moment there was faith that was released in his heart. He believed what Jesus said was possible. It was not the man that cured himself. It was only Jesus in that moment calling him forth and that word that called him forth that brought healing and cure to his life. And so whatever has been in your circumstance for a long time, as it says here, this man had been lying there in this condition for a long time. I want you to hear Jesus coming to you today asking you the question, do you want to get well? And I'm telling you, my hand's going up saying, yes, Lord, I want to be well. How about you? Okay. I do not want to be defined by what has been in my life. I want to be defined by what you're calling me to for my future. I'm going to grab that mat that I've been living on. I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to walk forward into the future that you have in store for me. There is hope for your life. Never, ever believe that, 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 that your life is hopeless. With Jesus, there is always hope. He's always stepping in to people's world and saying, do you want to get well? And our answer needs to be a resounding yes. I think we ought to just practice yes, Lord, right now. Would you say it? Yes, Lord. Okay. I want to be well. I want to be whole. I want to be restored. I'm picking up my mat. And I'm going to walk forward into my future. And that, in that moment, when our faith meets the power of God, there's the healing that comes to our life.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you here in Israel. We're right by the Sea of Galilee, as you see right behind me here. And I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. And I want to talk to you for a few moments about the miracle of the multiplication of the five loaves and the two fish. An amazing story. We're talking about the God of miracles, and we're taking a look at uh, how God works miraculously in our lives. And in John chapter 6, we, we, we see this story starting in verse number 1. I'm going to read for you for, from the New International Version. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. That is, again, what's right behind me here, the Sea of Galilee. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish fe Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he, he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had, had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the piece, pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of bar, five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You might recall that Jesus was spending some time teaching uh, multitudes of people. Not only would he perform miracles among the people, but also would gather them around for a great teaching time. And this had happened uh, in Jesus' ministry as well that particular day. And then after he's completed his teaching time with them, it's not recorded exactly what he was teaching, but of course teaching about his kingdom, teaching about the principles of God's work in people's lives, uh, then it, it came time for people to go home. And Jesus, one part of the gospel, said that he was moved with compassion. He saw these people who had been with him all day long, and they had nothing to eat. And so he looked at his disciples, and he said, okay, we need to give these folks something to eat. Now, just imagine with me for a moment. You guys have been around uh, Israel, this area, uh, for the last several days, and you've seen how barren everything is primarily, okay? And so if you're one of the disciples, and Jesus looks at you, and there's 5,000 people, plus men and plus women and children. So again, this is just the 5,000 men. So it could have been 15, 20,000 people there that day, including the, the women and the children. We know that children were there because the little boy gave the lunch, right? And so there had to be close to 15,000 people or more there. And Jesus looks at you and says, okay, guys, get them some food. What are you going to do? They were, they were faced with a test of their faith. And so what are we going to do in this situation? So they're scratching their heads. They're trying to figure out, what is he talking about? How are we supposed to get food to them? And Jesus said, well, just go see what you can find. Go take a look and see what's available. And of course, they go out into the crowd and they find the little boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they bring him back to Jesus. And of course, Jesus performs a miracle of breaking the bread and the, and the fish and that was distributed among the, among the people. And they all eight were satisfied and 12 baskets full were left over. But here's what I want, want to talk about. Almost every miracle that you see in the Bible, there's a, there's a combination that happens, a combination of, of, of human need, somebody's in a need, and then somebody is asked to do something, there's a human action, and then there's a God action, okay? So there's a need, there's something that people do, and then there's something that God does. Practically every miracle in the Bible requires something on our part, okay? That we bring something to the miracle. We can't perform the miracle, but there's something that we need to do. As I was reading this story this morning, I saw something that I actually have never seen before and never actually taught on here before. But it was something that was fresh to me, and I hope it'll be meaningful to you. And I saw four characters in this story that I never thought about in the same way. We all know the four characters, right? One character was the little boy, right? He's part of the story, right? Another part of the story, the disciples. Another part of the story, the crowd. And then, of course, the most significant part of the story is Jesus. So again, the boy, the disciples, the crowd and Jesus. Say it again, the boy, the disciples, the crowd, and Jesus. And all four of these were a part of this miracle. Okay, all four of them. The little boy, the disciples, 
the crowd, and Jesus, okay? Let's take a look at what all four of these contributed to or the, their part in the story. In every miracle, at least in many miracles, it starts with a giver, right? This miracle would have never happened had it not been for a little boy who gave away his lunch. Think about that. Now, can you imagine being the little boy and the disciples come to you and say, hey, you know, we need to take your lunch away from you, okay? And he's thinking, no, mommy gave me this lunch. It's my lunch. She told me I was supposed to have it for lunch. You can't take my lunch away from me. And so here's, he's faced with a decision as a little boy. What is he going to do with his lunch? But he did not realize in that moment that, had, that he was the one that could give. And then out of his giving, there could be the multiplication of a miracle. And you never know what you give to God, what God can do with it. But practically every miracle starts with somebody giving. We have amazing miracles in our church, but you know why we have many of those miracles in our church? Because along the way, people have given, right? We have a church building. Why? Because somebody gave so that church building could be built. People get saved every Sunday in our, our building. Why? Because somebody gave. They're a part of that miracle. So anytime you give, when you invest in the work of the kingdom of God, your giving sets things up for a miracle. This little boy made a gift of his, his lunch, and he was the giver that resulted in the miracle. So he was the first character in the story. Who's the second character? The disciples, exactly right. Now what did the disciples bring to the, to the situation? They brought serving, right? So the boy did the giving and the disciples did the serving. Anytime there are miracles, somebody has to serve up the miracle, right? Okay. This happens in church every weekend when someone comes to faith in Christ. You know how they come to faith in Christ? Somebody gave, but somebody's there serving. There's somebody taking care of the kids in the nursery. There's someone teaching the children in the children's ministry. There are people that are parking cars in the parking lot. There are people on the worship team that are leading worship. There's all kind of different parts of the body that are working together. And so miracles happen when people give and miracles happen when people serve, okay? So you got the givers, you got the servers, and then you've got a third group. What was that group? The crowd, they are the receivers, okay? Now, generally, that's the part we all want to be in, right, okay? <laughs> but you don't have the receivers unless you have the givers and the servers, right? You, people can't receive unless somebody's doing the giving and somebody's doing the serving, but that's where the need is. See, the need is, is in that moment of someone, they were hungry, they needed to be fed. And for them to be fed, there had to be a giver, there had to be some servers, and then they received the miracle of God. Every week in our church, we have opportunities for people that come through the doors and they are hungry for God's truth and hungry for God's word and ready to receive something that's gonna change their life. And so we need to raise up, continually raise up people like us here who are gonna be doing the giving, okay? And people are gonna be doing the serving so that there can be people who, who, who experience the receiving, right? And so at some point in time in your life, you have to move beyond the receiving. You don't wanna be a receiver your whole life, right? At some point in time, you know you're growing up in your faith if you move beyond just I'm a receiver to becoming a server and becoming a giver because when you become a server and a giver, you're able to help people experience the receiving in their life. So part of my challenge to you today is just to think about where you are in your journey. Are you still living in the receiving mode? Okay. Now, it's okay to be in a receiving mode for some period of time, but you don't want to stay there your whole life, okay? You want to move from the receiving to the giving and the serving, but then there's one more in the story. Who's the other one in the story? Jesus. Jesus he's the source, okay? There was no miracle, even though you, you, the boy could have given his lunch, and the disciples could have been willing to serve, and the crowd could have been hungry, but nothing would have happened without Jesus, okay? It was only when Jesus actually took those five loaves and two fish and lifted them up to the Father and said, here we are, Father, here's, I, and he blessed them and he began to break them and gave them to the disciples and they went out and distributed them to, among the crowd. That's when the miracle happened. I believe that, that amazing miracles happen when God gathers a group of hungry people who have needs. Somebody shows up and said, I'm willing to give, I'm willing to serve, and Jesus says, now I'm willing to be the source of miracles. My real challenge for you today is this. As a part of this message, my real challenge for you is this. I want to encourage every one of us in our journey with Jesus to move beyond the receiving to the place of being the givers and the servers, okay? Tremend See, now here's a great thing to remember. Did the giver and the server still get fed? Yes. Did they, okay? So we think when we give and serve, nothing's going to come back to us. But actually, 
there were 12 baskets full left over for those who had done the giving and the serving, right? And so you can never outgive God. You can never outserve God. Yet when you step up and say, I'm going to be a giver, I'm going to be a server, it's not that your needs go without being met. Jesus always takes care of those as well. And when you and I step up and become those kind of people, what God does, He, sh he shows up and does incredible miracles, but it happens through people like you and me. So God's called you to be a part of His miracle working power. He's the source but we're the givers and the servers that result in the feeding of people and the needs that they have in their lives. I'm ready to be a giver and a server. How about you? Okay. I don't want to be a receiver all my life. I want to be a giver and I want to be a server. Well, good afternoon here in the city or town of Capernaum. And uh, this is one of the cities that you'll see in your Bible that's repeated over and over again because really it was the, during the ministry of Jesus, it was really his hometown. He operated from here. Uh, and Peter and some of the apostles would have lived here as well as we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. We'll be in verse number 21. I'm reading from the New International Version. They went to Capernaum. So where are we right now? We're in the city, the village, the town of Capernaum. They went, speaking of Jesus and his disciples, to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue. Where did Jesus go? Synagogue. So uh, what I want to point out to you, and we'll learn more historically about it in a moment, but what you see to my right is a former synagogue, okay, the ruins of a synagogue. And from everything that I have learned about the synagogue, you see the darker stone down at the bottom here, okay? That would have been the original foundation, actually, of the synagogue that Jesus would have been in the, the, uh, the time that we read about here, okay? A, another synagogue built on top of it, obviously, but this represents a synagogue that we're reading about in the Gospel of Mark. So it's incredible. In just a moment, you'll have the opportunity of actually walking into this area and uh, walking, actually, if you will, on the foundation of the very synagogue where this passage of Scripture is based, all right? So they went to Capernaum. Where are we? Capernaum. So we're actually in this place that the Bible speaks of right now. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the? synagogue, which we're looking at right here. The people were amazed at his teaching. By the way, Jesus would often go to synagogues and were, he was invited to teach there oftentimes. And so this is one of those situations where he's beginning to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And so they sensed something about Jesus' teaching that was beyond just the normal. They sensed power. They sensed authority in what he was saying. There was something about him that was very different, obviously because he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out. So I want you to just imagine with me for a moment that here's Jesus preaching in this synagogue, obviously fairly small. It's not a huge environment, as you'll see when you walk in in a few moments. And as Jesus was teaching, there's a man that cries out in a loud voice. He's possessed by a demon spirit. And uh, here's what he cries out. What do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so here's this, this man demonized. And what is represented here is the fact that demons knew who Jesus was. Okay, So the demons are crying out, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One. So this man possessed by a demon spirit, this demon is crying out of him, identifying, in fact, who Jesus was. Verse 25, be quiet, said Jesus sternly, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And so here was this moment that this man interrupts the service, if you will. He cries out with a loud voice, uh, speaking of who Jesus was. Jesus addresses the spirit, and now the spirit, this evil spirit, comes out of him. This is why one of the things I want to remind you of is that the world that we live in, there are two dimensions of this world that we live in. There's the seen dimension and there's the unseen dimension. I think a lot of Christians don't recognize that we live in a world that has a spiritual environment. In the spiritual environment, there are, yes, angelic beings that exist. There's the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, but also there's a dark world of the Spirit as well. 
demons are reality. Demons do exist. I think sometimes we kind of push that off as something sort of out of Hollywood or what sort of a mystical idea, but no, there are real demonic spirits that impact people, impact the way people think, the way people live. It's an important reality. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 6, where he reminds us that the battle that we fight is not a natural battle. We're not fighting with flesh and blood, but with spiritual powers and realities in the dark realm of the, of, of the world, the world of the spirit, the spiritual realm that, that, that we have to be aware of. And so Jesus is contending with this demon spirit. He commands the spirit to come out of him. And of course, this man is delivered. Notice verse 27. The people were all, were, were all so amazed that they ask each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. And so they recognize that earlier they thought when he's teaching, boy, he teaches with a certain kind of authority. He doesn't seem to be the same kind of teacher as our teachers of the law are. And then, of course, Jesus demonstrates his authority by casting out the spirit. And they were even more amazed by that reality as well. So what I want you to be reminded of today is that Jesus has power over the world of darkness. That's the primary lesson I want you to learn, okay? So many times we, we think about even the dark realm, we get, uh, we get afraid and we should certainly have an awareness of that, but you must understand that with Christ in you, there is victor victory over the realms of darkness. Jesus has conquered the adversary, okay? We're no longer seeking to hopefully have a victory, but on the cross of Calvary, Jesus put a Put, uh, dealt a, a blow of a victory over the adversary by his resurrection as well. So you and I stand in the victory of Christ and because of his name, we have power over the adversary as well. So that's, that reminds us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Now, I want to continue the story here because it's very important. It goes on to say that uh, after this transpired, I mean, the people were so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a teaching with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon, notice verse 29. This is where I want you to see. As soon as they left the synagogue, so what's right here? the synagogue, they went to with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Here's what I want you to see. Jesus ministers here in this synagogue. There's a, there's a deliverance of a man with an impure spirit, and of course, people are amazed. And then with James and John, they go to the home of Simon and Andrew. And what you're going to see is just as you walk right over there, you see where this section is right over here to my, that I'm pointing to? They walk literally to the home of, of Peter's mother-in-law and their home. And so you see right here in scriptures, we'll walk there in just a moment, how short of a distance it was. And there's been an exca excavation there that you'll see the, the, the ruins or the remains of this very house that we're talking about in scripture. So it's an amazing thing just to bring the validity of scripture back to our mind that exactly what the Bible says is true is true. A confidence that we can have in scripture that the word of God is the very word of God. So just a quick reminder, two things today. Jesus has power over the adversary. You and I have power as well in his name. And the scriptures are absolutely true that what Jesus said happened really happens because archaeology has proven the reality of the very thing you see in the word of God. So good reminder, great recognition of the power, the authority of scripture and his work in our lives. Fantastic. I hope you received something today that strengthened you, that encouraged your heart, that reminded you that God wants to bring the provisions of heaven into your life. Perhaps you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Maybe there's never been a time that you have specifically invited Jesus to be in your life. This is the decision that you need to make today. There's no decision more important than the decision to open your heart to Jesus. To know that in fact your name is written in the book of life for eternity. To know that when you die, you're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. That's the destination we all desire. But it involves a choice on our part. We have to choose to put our faith in Jesus. We choose him as our savior. We put our confidence in the fact that he died on the cross for our sins and that he rose from the grave. And that we, when we invite him into our life and put our faith in him, he comes in and changes us from the inside and allows us to become a part of his family. I'm telling you, there's nothing greater than that, nothing more beautiful than that, and something that God wants to do in your life if you've never experienced it. So if you've never invited Jesus into your life at any point, let today be your day. Right now, I want to lead you in a very important prayer. 
This prayer provides an opportunity for you in this moment to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. So if you've never done so, would you pray this prayer with me right now? Just bow your head right where you are and just from your own heart as I lead you, I'll give you words to pray, but the important thing is that you pray them from your heart sincerely. And if you'll pray it sincerely, Jesus will come into your life today. Join me as we pray. Start by just uh, mentioning, whispering the name Jesus, declaring the name Jesus, just speak his name, Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm so sorry for all the things I've done wrong. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're the Savior of the world. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you're alive. Now pray something like this. Say, Jesus, right now, come into my life. You ask him into your life right now. Come into my life, Jesus. Forgive me for all of my sins. Today, I put my faith in you as my personal Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you so much for each person that just prayed that prayer with me. I thank you that you heard them. And now, Lord, I pray you'll help them to grow in you, to discover the joy of living for you every day and following your will for their lives, or discovering the joy of being your child, walking in fellowship with you. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me and I'm gonna give you a prayer to pray and you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God and I promise you that he will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of his name. Say, Jesus, I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's son. I believe that you are the savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out and you become a new creation. All things pass away, all things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time. If you've prayed with a pastor today and made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, we have some resources for you on our website. Just go to church-redeemer.org slash a new you. We pray that this message was a blessing to you.